we are going to have five lightning talks. We are going to start with the Boston Closure, uh, Boston Closure Bridge community uh, led by Elena uh, with a quick introduction and experience report. We are going to have uh, the Spanish speaking community updates with uh, Mauricio and Leandro. Uh, we are going to see Mecca, an animated music editor in Closure Script. And we are going to see an introduction to Omnitrace by Lucas. And finally, Athens, a multi-client event synchronizer. So, hand tight. All right. Hello. Um, so I'm Yelena Machkasova. Um, and uh, my co-presenter actually is not here, but um, uh, he's probably more entitled to speak about Boston Closure Meetup. So Mark, uh, I think he pronounces his last name Champagne, but I'm not sure. Um, and he was lead organizer for Boston uh, Closure Meetup uh, since 2016. Um, so uh, Boston Closure Meetup, uh, this meetup uh, has over 600 members currently. Um, and uh, Mark counted uh, 95 meetups that were held. Um, and uh, it sort of stopped uh, as COVID started. I was actually supposed to give a talk in March and that never happened. Um, and then restarted as virtual uh, in April, 2021. Uh, and actually that opened a few opportunities for uh, having remote talks and uh, we had some uh, participants from other countries uh, and had to adjust our schedule a little bit. Uh, the meetup was founded in 2011 by Eric Cobran. Um, so I don't know how it um, relates to other meetups, probably was one of the first. Uh, and Mark was the lead organizer, uh, as I said, since 2016. Um, this is the current group of um, organizers. Uh, so Tom for a while was hosting in person until COVID happened. And Jeremy is very active and John um, and myself. And now it's virtual, which is actually quite convenient for me because I don't live in Boston. So it's a little ironic that uh, I'm talking about Boston meetup, um, but I did my PhD in Boston. I lived there for a long time and I have a lot of um, friends and uh, some family there. So I kind of consider it my second home and um, that's how, how I'm involved in it. Um, as one of the organizers, I would like to advertise our next talk, which is which will actually be by Mark. Um, and here is the title, and it's going to be uh, this coming week. Um, so hope to see you there virtually. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention um, is that um, the same group um, around 2016, 2017, uh, ran three rounds of uh, Boston Closure Bridge. So that's um, an outreach. This is an, an international organization that aims to increase diversity within closure community uh, by offering free beginner-friendly closure programming workshops for underrepresented groups in tech, so specifically for underrepresented genders. Uh, so this is what um, this looked like. This is our first closure bridge um, in 2016 at Akamai. Um, so uh, this is the organizing committee. Um, and it's a little hard to tell how many learners we had because lots of people sign up and then don't show up as it happens. Uh, one thing that any organizer knows, you need to be patient uh, and understanding. But we had about 20, 25 learners at each of them, about 10 to 15, maybe 12 mentors, and two tracks for those new to programming and for those new to closure. And so these were our meetups, two hosted in Akamai, at Akamai and one hosted at MIT. Um, and we did a little bit of change in curriculum from um, traditional, um, well, and there is no standard. So every group does something a little different. 
So ours was somewhat based on Minneapolis curriculum and some other things. Um, and one nice thing that happened because of that is um, it's, it's always an all day Saturday event, but they, uh, some groups had a mandatory Friday install fest, which made it less accessible and we made it optional so that people could install their own software and we sort of streamline that process. Uh, and another interesting thing that it featured was career panel um, and lots of participants actually mentioned how valuable that was. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, I'll be on Discord. I would love to see more closure bridge happening. And so anybody who is interested, uh, we should talk. Of course, they're better in person. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. Uh, really nice to know what other meetups, what other lead like organizers are doing around the world. And uh, in this respect, we are having another experience support this time from the Spanish speaking community. Um, yes, hello. Is. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, Mauricio and Leandro. Uh, can you hear me, Mauricio? Yes, I can hear you. Just ah, fine. Nice, 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 nice. And uh, we are presenting the Spanish speaking closure community, or probably a Spanish speaking closure community. We don't know whether there, is, there are others, so there could be others. Um, uh, contrary to a normal community, like uh, we, uh, we share the language. In, in, in the sense that normally a, a users group would be um, based on a physical location. So that was the case with the people from the Boston community. In this case, uh, we are based around the language. Uh, why is that? Uh, because, well, even though many of us do speak English with the varying degrees of, um, fluency. Uh, there are things that uh, you can always uh, express uh, bet better in, in your own language. So that's the basic reason why. Uh, we also have people um, who, who come from uh, a different uh, native languages like Mauricio. Uh, maybe you want to speak a little bit about you? Yeah, sure. So I was invited to the Spanish speaking community mostly because I am right now living in a Spanish speaking country, but I am originally from Brazil. So I'm kind of in this strange situation when I do have, like, I am in the community of Clojure Brazil and Clojure US and also Clojure Spanish. So it's quite interesting for me. And yeah, we are still a small community. Uh, we're trying to organize more meetups. I think we only have one meetup organized so far, right? And yeah, so that's that's mostly how I met the group. And unfortunately, I couldn't go to the first meetup, but I am really, really wanting to share more about the, the community because well, we are, as I told, still small. We want to grow. And Spanish is a really, really big language. It's one of the most spoken languages in the globe. So there's no reason why you should be so, so small. Our goal, I don't know if Leandro told us, told everybody, but it's, it's word domination. But we don't talk too much about that. Otherwise, people will think we are super villains. <laughs> we want to be able to okay. achieve it otherwise. Um, so is this a link that you're posting here on the slide uh, a good place to know yes. a little more about your, your meeting? Actually, uh, we are a Telegram group, basically. Okay. Um, in, uh, in the Spanish-speaking world, Telegram is very popular. So we started with that. Uh, we have m around uh, 70 members. Uh, some, of, some of us are like experience in other communities. Uh, for instance, in my case, uh, I worked at the local community in my hometown in Argentina. Uh, I also work, I, I also helped in a closure community in, in Buenos Aires a few years ago, where I used to live. We also organized a closure bridge in, I think, 2017. And I think Mauricio also has history with the communities. 
Yeah, uh, mostly Ruby and Clojure community in Brazil. So yeah. Um, okay. For us, it, it's very important to be here so the, the rest of the world can know about us and uh, get the word known. So please uh, join our group and let's uh, get in touch. Thank you very much. Fantastic. For... Thank you very much. Um, I'm going now to uh, switch uh, to uh, like a, a more technical, entertaining uh, lightning talks. We have uh, uh, Mecca an animated music editor in Closure Script by uh, Bobby Towers. And uh, I'm going to, uh, for this, I'm going to show you this. Okay, I can do this. What I want to do is show the individual parts. And so yeah, this is all of the music data, which is just a sequence of maps. Each map is a note that has a time, an instrument, and a pitch. That is literally it. And each one of these is what I would call a pattern. This is a base one. So, and it takes a time and a root so that you can uh, modulate it or transpose it to whatever. And uh, so, we're just dispatching it to reframe here. We'll get a smaller one here. And so, yeah, this base one pattern this was what it all started from and where's my up where's, where's my up uh, where's my, where's my up all right that's it um Base two. And so then uh, we could concatenate those. I think that should be right. And 
And so that's all there is to it. And so then the whole song is just this this giant ass concatenation. And uh, so let's hear it once just for completeness. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. I love y'all. Well, not sure what I was looking at, at least at the beginning, but it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Uh, it was uh, really nice. All right, um, moving on. So the uh, next thing is the next lightning talks in is introducing Omnitrace with Lucas. Um, so Omnitrace, I started it like a week ago, not two weeks ago now. Uh, the idea was um, that I really liked uh, how flame grass work uh, for uh, performance stuff and it's really sad that uh, you can't really use them to debug and to look into code traces of other stuff and the idea was to uh, build a tool that lets you use it um, the basic thing is you have got it kind of works like Said, uh, just on the closure script side plus on the closure side um, you can say, okay, I want to run something with a trace. Uh, like you say, okay, I want to run tra traced and uh, the, what it is that you want to run. Uh, this is just a function. Uh, the, and once I run it, uh, I get the usual output that the function has. And then I can tap it. Um, the flame graph is just um, a Vega JS specification with all the data uh, from the run. And if I tap it and then uh, jump over to uh, portal, I can see uh, that trace with uh, all the stuff that was called uh, from this function. Um, here I can zoom in, I can zoom out. It's not very helpful in such a small graph, but still uh, I can click on it to uh, the height, the side stuff. I can mouse over it to see in the tooltip what it was called with, uh, what the return was, and so on. Um, I can also move it around and stuff. Um, the other thing that's currently working, kind of, <laughs> is integration with debugs. Uh, the idea is to inner trace a uh, function. Uh, we've got a factorial function that's here somewhere. Um, and when I trace this, um i can see that in the, the workspace um, i've got like the normal graph i usually have uh, but i've also got an interest that's telling me okay uh, they're here num at uh, some position uh, they have the value three and so on um so i'm basically uh tracing every single call in this factorial uh the thing and then also putting it into the graph so that i could display it in the flame graph um, currently there's no display for this yet, um, but I've got the data now. I just need to show it. So, um, okay. I, we can do inner traces. Uh, like I said, we can uninstrument the stuff we instrumented. We can res reset stuff. Um, we can also do uh, tracing. The deep trace does not only work on your own code. It works on the libraries that you're using as well. Currently, there's a blacklist for uh, the core namespace. You can disable that blacklist and then run the code uh, the, with tracing into uh, the core namespace. So here you can see uh, I've got traces on keep and I don't know, where is it? Uh, on keep and plus, well, you I guess you can't see it since it's too small, um, but you'll have to believe me that this is uh, the tracing into the call, uh, into the core namespace. Uh, we can also set that back. Uh, the problem that usually uh, arises from such tracing libraries is that the data is getting too big. 
And uh, here we've got uh, max call sites where uh, in every call site that uh, he remembers how often something uh, below it was called. So if I uh, trace the testing function and then run it 100 times through a map, uh, I can see, okay, we only remembered 100 of those calls uh, so that my uh, trace doesn't get too large. You can uh, the, the start how large it should get. Um, and the final thing uh, that's already working, you see this exception, uh, it's because this thing is throwing an exception, um, but it's getting uh, the handled inside uh, the, the, the call trace. And here you can see, well, I guess you can't because it's too small, um, but usually you could see um, the arguments that went into the exploding call and uh, what the exception was at that type. So that uh, the, if you do something like this, you do, you know which one of those exploded and so on. Um, or if you do a deep trace and something explodes on the way, you also know uh, what happened. Um, what I'm currently working on or what's already working, if I can get the, my pull request into portal, is that if you press a key here, uh, you can uh, jump into the code because this trace knows uh, where this happened. So which file it was, which column it was and so on. And if you press D, it's gonna start your, well, it's gonna take VS code at this uh, or Emacs or whatever. And it's gonna show you which part this is in. And the other thing that's already working as well, well just waiting for the pull request uh, to go through um, is, uh, copying of your uh, the execution so that uh, when you press the C key, you get uh, this into your buffer um, so that uh, you just have to paste it in. And um, uh, now it's too small. Uh, the uh, call arcs that were used uh, get pasted in as well so that you can run it uh, from like deeper in the graph if you want to play around with it uh, in a REPL again. Um, yeah, what I'm currently working on is uh, the getting the data in here on the fly instead of pushing all of it in at the, uh, at the start. Um, right With this graph, it's not a problem. Uh, at some point, it's going to get too big for uh, Vega to handle. Uh, so if I click something like this, it would be nice if the stuff below it gets loaded after and not already is not already present. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lucas. We need That's to... It. Sorry. Switch to the next one. Um, but I think we, we, we got a gist of uh, what uh, uh, what Omnitrace can do. And and uh, thank you very much, Lucas. It was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. So um, we are going for the last uh, Lightning Talks of the day. Uh, Felipe Silva, Athens, a multi-client event synchronizer. Take it away, Luke. Felipe. Um, hi, um, my name is Felipe. Um, I want to clarify something here. Athens itself is, is not the, the synchronizer that we're talking about. Athens is the application that uses uh, the synchronizer. And I think I think I, I can like give you a quick idea of you know what it's meant to do. Um, and let me share my screen uh, because that is inherently uh, relevant to like what why we need a synchronizer. Uh, like generically, you look at this. This is just like you know some notes about uh, reclosure. And you know, I can come here and edit some stuff. Um, and it says here, F, you know, that, that stands for me, Philippe. Um, the important part here is that, uh, like this, this is actually a multi-user application. Um, like you can't see other users right now because I didn't ask anyone else from my team to come here, but this is inherently a multi-user application. And I'm, I'm going to stop sharing and just talk a little bit about that. So like it's it's one of those traditional architectures where you have reframe and you, you know, model, model everything with events. And like a lot of the state that you were seeing uh, was actually represented in data script database. Um, and it's really nice to have a data script database because you can like do very complex things in memory and still have a data. But then how do you actually, like if you have multiple people working on the same thing, how do you make sure that your database is in sync with their database? Um, and that's not so trivial. Uh, and like this inherently is very uh, client side heavy. Like you do a lot in the client side and you just, uh, in your head, you kind of think, oh, I just want to synchronize some bits with other clients, but we want everyone to be at the same state. Um, 
And if you've ever used uh, DataScript or any of the other data log databases, you kind of have this intuitive notion that um, if you, you have like your history of transactions and like the whole state is determined by that history of transactions. So would there be a good way of actually synchronizing all those transactions with other versions of the same client on other people's computers um, that, that like to arrive at the same state? And that's what we try to do. We haven't published this as a library, but it's what we use to do this in Athens, where we kind of came to this concept. Well, if you actually have this list of events um, and you have a part of them, it's, it's purely just exists on your client. It's, there's kind of like the optimistic ones. And then there's like the real ones that were already propagated to everyone. Uh, but you can still look at this as like a whole list. And you can say, well, while you're synchronizing this little bit, uh, how about you still operate over it and you still go over your, your reframe and your data script database and you apply everything optimistic. Um, and then when kind of like reality changes from behind you, you just go and like remove everything, apply the new tip of reality and then apply all the optimistic stuff. Um, this is what we try to do in hopefully a generic enough fashion. Um, and this, this little, I'm oh, sorry, let me try and find it here. I think it's this Chrome window. Uh, in this little library, it's, it's a single file. Um, we call it event sync. Uh, the idea is that if you, if you have like this model where you have a certain log of uh, what should be reality, you can split it into phases, into stages even. And some of these stages are more grounded in reality than others. Like some of these are actually on the server, some of these maybe were persisted to the uh, local storage on your client. And some of these are purely in memory because they went nowhere else. Um, I'm, I think I already put this link in Lightning Talks channel. Um, this link contains an example of how it works, how it deals with some concurrency cases. Uh, it just operates over the concept that you can view a list of events that are being synchronized still as a single list of events that has a certain order. Uh, but then you just need to know when you go back in time and uh, something got inserted in the middle and when you need to kind of decide what to do about the inconsistency. And I think I think that's time. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Felipe. This was perfectly in time. Uh, thank you very much, Felipe. I appreciate it. <laughs>